like to to start in a uh, informal way, you know. Um, I don't like to start saying, uh, here we are, welcome everybody, okay? Mm. Um, I, I like to use this, um, this moment like a, a conversation, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, in, in, this, in this particular uh, interview, I'm really uh, interested in so much things that I think 30 minutes will be not enough. But um, I will ask you um, the most important things to, to me. And uh, actually, it's it's very interesting to having you here now because, you know, you uh, you start as a, um, a solution focused therapist, you know, I uh, quite inside in brief therapies. I study solution focused, but also strategic therapy, Ericsson therapy and, uh, and so on. And then um, you, you continue with feedback informant treatment and then uh, deliberate practice. So um, this is also a little disturbing, you know, because uh, it needs to have a change of mindset, which is, um, it's disturbing. I'm chasing you since, I don't know, three or four years. Uh, maybe you remember that I told you uh, three or four times, I'm coming to Chicago, this is the here, I'm coming, I'm coming. And, and, uh, and it was a, a resistance of mine, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have time to talk about that. Um, before that, let's say, um, could you please give to me and to the audience um, uh, an idea about feedback, informant, treatment and uh, deliberate practice in a nutshell. I, I'm asking you so much, but mm. can you do this for me? Sure. Feedback informed treatment emerged out of research findings which showed that it didn't matter which model of treatment you practiced. We all ended up with about the same outcomes as a field. As you've mentioned, I was part of the Brief Family Therapy Center in Milwaukee and Solution Focused Therapy. And one reason that the team split was because our research came back and it said that we were no more effective than anyone else. So why do solution focused if it doesn't help you become more effective than you were before? And so a pragmatic decision was made, which was maybe we can't figure out how therapy works, but we could certainly find out if it was working for this person or not. And there was other data that showed that therapists were not particularly good at knowing when their clients were going to drop out or when they were going to stay but not experience benefit or even when the clients were getting worse. They, they all were very confident that they could, but the research said something else. And so measuring and monitoring our outcomes and the client's engagement with us was a pragmatic solution to those problems. Okay, I don't know what to say with regard to how to work. I don't know the best model, but I can certainly teach you a way that you could find out if you were helping a particular client in your practice or not. That's feedback informed care. And we simply picked up on two key research findings. If, if we're gonna monitor, well then what should we measure? What should we look at? And there were two ideas. The first one was the outcome, of course. And we chose as the outcome a measure of well being or functioning. And the reason we chose that was because people's sense of well being is what predicts best when they decide, I need help. And it also predicts fairly well when the client decides, I've had enough help as opposed to symptoms or other constructs that are popular in therapeutic circles about what's causing the distress that people have. So the one thing we thought about measuring was 
those results in terms of well-being or distress. The second item we thought, which was common across therapeutic traditions, was the quality of the relationship. And we thought that was a good thing to monitor and measure since relationship from the client's point of view predicted their engagement in the care, how active they were, how interested they were, how participatory they were, which research showed was a very good predictor of outcome. So we just settled on those two variables. Well, is the person changing? And are they engaged with me in the, in the care process? I measure and monitor each visit and I would have discussions with, with the clients about that. And we were doing that for some time, actually, before there was any research support for it. Theoretically, it all made sense. And then the first studies started coming out by a former professor of mine, Michael Lambert, that suggested that when therapists had access to such data, that the outcomes improved, in particular when we were off track, when we weren't making progress, or when we weren't aligned with the client properly. If the therapist could become informed about that, then the outcomes tended to improve. So that's fit. And again, born out of a pragmatic experience that was, we can't figure out the right way to work and teach people so that it leads to better outcomes. It was, it's, that still surprisingly is a very controversial notion. And we've never said, I've never said, don't learn a, an approach. I, I've, I've never said that, although people routinely misunderstand it. What I say about fit is that it is agnostic with regard to treatment method. Somebody says, well, I do CBT. Is that okay? I say, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I don't care if you do CBT, ACT, whatever. T is currently popular. It's fine with me. As long as the client wants to drink it. If they don't want to drink in it, and, and if they don't find it nourishing, well, then time for a new T. Otherwise, we risk dropout or lack of change. Now, here's what happens when we begin monitoring and measuring. So I, for me, at least, I've simply, and I feel very lucky about this, I've simply followed where the data has pointed. So initially, our data said, Solution focused is fine, but it didn't do what I wanted, which was make me more effective. So I had to leave. I had to, I had to leave that behind in the same way that I left behind kindergarten. I, I, don't, I don't think of kindergarten as a bad experience. I don't think it was unuseful. It just, I have to move beyond that. So when we start monitoring and measuring, we end up with another dilemma. And that dilemma is that certain therapists in our samples rose to the top like cream on top of milk. And this was a very puzzling finding. We weren't the first to notice it. The field has known this for decades and absolutely ignored it. It's something that every therapist knows. They know that that therapist over there is amazing. I'm not as good as that. We, we all know this. I know this. But we've avoided it. And we've pretended as if if you practice this model, we'll all be equally effective. Well, that's nonsense. And the data says it's nonsense. But no one could explain it. In 2010, Okishi, together with Lambert and others, published another study. This is a massive study monitoring outcomes of therapists. And once again, they find certain therapists are better than others. And they end the article saying, it's a mystery as to why. And we saw this, I thought initially, to be honest, I thought this, some therapists rising to the top, I thought it was randomness. I thought just like stocks in the stock market next year, it will go down or up and predicting who was better. It was a fool's errand. I thought, well, I was wrong year after year. The same therapists were at the top and it didn't matter who they saw, what type of problems they had or seemingly so. And again, we were, we were lost. I was lost and I was on an airplane 
And I reached in the pocket in front of me. I'm often on airplanes pre-pandemic. And there was an article in a magazine that I never read. I've, I've never even looked at this magazine. It's called Fortune Magazine. It's a money magazine. So this is how bored I was on the airplane. I'd read a, a, a magazine about money and investing. And in there, there was an article by, uh, by the editor, Jeff Colvin, about a guy named Anders Ericsson. I'd never heard of Anders Ericsson. And what's weird about that is I lived in Sweden, the country he's from, for many for many years. I speak the language. My heritage is Scandinavian. And he he now lives in the United States. I never heard of him. And he's a psychologist. I never heard of him. That's because he'd never been cited by any psychotherapist in the history of our field. What is Erickson about? Erickson has been focused his entire career on why some people within a particular performance domain like chess or music or computer programming or surgery, why some rise to the top and everyone else stays the same or worse. And he had an explanation for that. Deliberate practice. Some performers within each performance domain spend more time pushing at the edge of their performance pushing themselves to move just beyond what they're currently capable of doing. And he'd outlined the specific things that people needed to do, performers needed to do, to, to move their performance forward. He also pointed out that most people do not do that across professions. And it, it was a really disturbing thing to hear him say, most of us devote our entire li lives to our careers and we are no better at it at the end than we are at the beginning. He says, that's astonishing, really. Now, the puzzle is all of us think we're better. But Erickson said, when you actually look at the results, like driving, for example, we're not better drivers than we were when we first started, Erickson said. We're not better walkers. That's actually his famous quote. He says, just because you've been walking for 55 years doesn't mean you get better at it day by day. He said, what you, what you get is more confident because the terrain doesn't change and you don't push your performance to the next level. You want to see how good of a walker you are, go trek an alpine path. Don't walk from your home to your office every day. You know, it, it just makes sense. Reading that article that day was like a religious experience. I was like, oh my God, you know, how could we have missed this? I didn't even know it. And why didn't I know about Erickson? Most of his material had been published in dry academic journals and speaking to a very small clique of people that uh, were interested in expertise, like Olympic athletes, top performing musicians or actors, but nobody had ever asked. So being of Swedish descent and speaking the language, I called him on the phone. He answers the phone and uh, he really helped the team and I figure out how we could investigate this in psychotherapy. So my point here is, is that all of this has been sort of a natural progression of, well, wait a minute, solution focus doesn't make me better. So it's not about the method. Maybe I should measure, then at least I know who I'm helping. Well, wait a minute, some are more effective than others. How can I explain that? Because it's not the model they're using. I've been down that route. So it must be something else, a serendipitous event chance event. I see this article and suddenly there is a door open that hadn't been opened previously. And that is deliberate practice. Focused attention and practice at the edge of your performance designed to help you reach for objectives just beyond your current ability. And of course, as you know, Daryl Chow, who published the first study of deliberate practice in the history of psychotherapy, found that the more effective a therapist was, the more time they spent in deliberate practice. Two and a half times more than therapists with average effectiveness, 14 times more than therapists who were the least effective in the sample. And what's really curious is you ask the therapists themselves, how effective are you? The least effective say they are just as effective as the most effective. 
no wonder we can't get better if we all think we're 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 as good as the best kind of crazy making really so that's fit and deliberate practice